Good evening. I want to start by telling a story. I hope that's okay. I don't know if this is a uh, true story or not, but it's something that I read and I found it to be quite powerful, at least in reference to what we're talking about tonight, which is faith. There was a couple, it was a husband and a wife, and they decided that they were going to take their love for the Lord and they were gonna to travel to a different country. And they were gonna live there for a couple of years and they were gonna make disciples of Christ and they were gonna share the gospel and they were gonna bring people to the Lord. And so they go to this country and they, they make a home and they start making friendships and they build a life there and after a couple of years, they haven't baptized anybody. There are no disciples, there's no Christians, it's only them. And they're trying and they're working at it. And, and another couple of years goes by and it's six years in and, and their congregation that is supporting them reaches out and says, hey, listen, it's been six years. We've, we've, we've given it the old college try. I, I think we might, we might think about pulling back our support. We're, 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 gonna, we're gonna consider that. You, you've got some time, it's, it's not right now. You've got some time. So obviously they're, they're heartbroken, they're devastated. And it turns out they had about another couple of years, maybe another two years, that they were gonna be able to stay there. And within a year of that conversation, uh, it, was, uh, it was the birthday of the wife. And a friend that she had sent her a message and said, what, what would you like for your birthday? It's been a while since I've sent you something, what would you like? And they thought about it, they prayed about it, and they sent back a message and said, some communion cups, some Lord's Supper emblems, some trays which we can pass around because we're gonna have some Christians here real soon. And the, the shipment got delayed, but the day before the shipment came in, they had six people put on Christ in baptism. And the day after the shipment came in, was the Lord's Day. So they got to celebrate, got to celebrate together as new Christians gathered together in this country, eight people. That faith that they have, not in themselves, it's the power of the gospel that saves, it's not man's word, it's not my word, there's nothing that I'm gonna say up here that is any more powerful than what is in the Word of God. My job is simply to express what is here in the hopes that it might prick our hearts, that it might prick my heart. Faith is a, it's a difficult thing to define, isn't it? To define faith. But I think if we don't define faith, we are at a distinct disadvantage when we talk about it. The last time I was up here, I, I spoke about a lot of qualities that a Christian ought to have, a Christian's life of righteousness from 2 Timothy. And the very first thing that it starts with is, is faith. That's the, that's the foundation of who we are, the foundation of our lives. If we have not faith, we have nothing. And that's my premise to you tonight. Not that the other things are unessential, but rather that faith is essential. We must have faith. And so if you would, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, please. We'll spend quite a bit of time here. I, I will go throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament at various points, but you, you might do well to stay in Hebrews 11 and have it open there and reading along with me. As Brother Ted read, Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who? God. It is impossible to please God, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Well, what is faith? Without it, we can't please God, but what is it? How do we have it? How do we obtain it? Well, in verse 1, we read that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not 
seen. And there are three words in that verse that I think are instrumental to understanding what faith is. And that is assurance, hoped, and conviction. To be assured of something means to be reassured, to know that it's going to happen, to understand that it's going to happen. We assure at times children that it's going to be okay. You don't have to, you don't have to cry about the little boo-boo on your arm. You're going to be okay. We reassure them. We assure them it's going to be okay. And so assurance is, is this, this knowledge then that we have. It's a confidence. We're confident in in what? Well, of things hoped for. We are confident in things that are hoped for. Now, when we think of hope today, what do we, what do we think? Kind of like a wish, right? That's how we view it today. Almost like you, you, know, you rub the genie and you get a genie comes out of the bottle and you get three wishes. I hope that I get this. I hope that I get that. I hope that I... That's not what biblical hope is. Biblical <laughs> hope, the word in the Greek is elpizo. It's a knowledge, it's an understanding, it's a belief. And so then we have confidence of the things that we know. We have confidence in things that we know, and then it's this conviction, this, this strong belief of things not seen. Can you see faith? Is that a physical entity that you can see? What about, what about your sins being removed from you at the time of baptism? Can you see the sins physically being removed from your body at the time of baptism? We don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we know that he is. We hope in that. It's a knowledge that we have. In fact, that's what we rest our, our faith on, right? that Jesus is returning, that this life is, that, that what we do in this life is not all there is, but rather that there is more, that heaven awaits, that eternity with God awaits. That's, that's why we're here. I mean, if that's not why we're here, I'm, I'm not really quite sure why we are. If we don't believe Jesus is coming back, if we don't believe that we have an eternity in heaven with God, if we don't believe that Jesus died, rose again, and, and will be back on this earth, what are we doing here? Faith in God, faith in Jesus is absolutely vital to everything that we do. In fact, I, I go so far as to say that faith should be like breathing for us. If we don't breathe, we don't live. It's a very basic understanding of breathing. You know, people ask me, what's your favorite thing to do, Chris? And my response is breathing. I, I enjoy breathing. So it means I'm, I'm living. Faith. If we don't have faith, are we really living? Maybe, but very selfishly, very self-centeredly. It's certainly not living the way that we ought to. And so faith should be in every facet of our lives. Everything that we do should be ingrained with an idea of faith. We do it because we love God. We do it because God has commanded us to. We do it because it is the will of God. We do it because God. Faith. So, so important. So tonight, we're going to talk about roughly nine different characters. I'm not going to spend too long on any of them. But we're going to talk about roughly nine different characters. And the first group of characters that you see on the left right there are going to be those without faith. Those people in the scriptures who, who did not have faith, and, and we'll look a little bit at, at their, uh, what happened to them, uh, and then also we're going to look next at those who found faith, those who we see in the scriptures who acquired faith in some way, shape, form, or fashion. They didn't have it, and they heard something, they saw something, and they obtained Faith And last, we're going to do a, I guess, a little bit of an exercise, if you will. And we're going to think about what might have happened to this world, to people, if these individuals did not have faith. So, so let's talk about Pharaoh, shall we? Pharaoh from Egypt. I would argue, in some senses, he did have faith, but certainly not in God. He had faith in himself. He believed that he was 
all powerful, that he could handle anything. And, and he wanted so bad, so bad to keep his workforce, the slaves that he had, the Israelites, that he was unwilling to part with them at all. And so from Exodus chapter 7 all the way through 12, we read about Moses and his battle with Pharaoh. And so in chapter 7, we see that Moses and Aaron come before Pharaoh and they, they turn, the, 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 turn the staff into a serpent. I wanted to say a, a wand or a cane, but it's a staff is what it says. They turn the staff into a serpent. And then the magicians somehow do the same thing. And then we get to the first plague. The first plague, the entire Nile River from water to blood. Now the Nile, even today, is vital to the health of Egypt. For if the Nile is not flowing well, the crops that were, especially back then, the crops that are on the side of the Nile, well, they, they perish. The people, that was their main water source. That was where they got water to drink, water to bathe, water to do whatever it was that they needed. And so the idea then that for seven days there was no water, and not only was there no water, but it was blood, would have been incredibly detrimental to the entire society of Egypt, to the entire nation. But Pharaoh says in verse 23, chapter 7, Pharaoh turned and went into his house, and he did not take even this to heart. Eh. Blood for a week, whatever, not a big deal. And then the second plague comes, frogs. These frogs cover the land, and then the third plague, the gnats, the fourth plague, flies, and verse 32 says, Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also. He's been doing that. He's been hardening his heart. It says, and did not let the people go. Can't go worship. You can't do, do what you want. Then we get the fifth plague, their livestock. Their livestock dies. Well, what do you eat if you don't have livestock? Grain? It's not a great diet. Back then, especially, they didn't have the, the, the resources that we do at our disposal today. Their livestock dies. And, and, and then the sixth plague, they get boils all over their body. I mean, painful, awful boils. It says, the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he did not listen to them as the Lord had spoken to Moses. His heart was still not willing to mend or to break, to open up and to let the Israelites go. And then we get the seventh plague, and it's hail. Now we're actually kind of familiar with hail here in Texas, aren't we? Unfortunately, it's not the most fun thing, and at times it's deadly. Well, especially here, we see that this particular plague is deadly. At the end of verse 19, it says, every man and beast that is in the field and is not brought home will die when the hail falls on them. So now we're talking about loss of life. People that, that are out doing what they need to do to survive, but they're not told, particularly the Egyptians are not told because Pharaoh's hardened his heart. He's not willing to talk to them about it, let them know what's coming. So you have people that die because of one man's hardness of heart. And then you get locusts. These locusts are going to just destroy the crops. So now they don't, they don't have livestock, they don't have crops, they don't have food. These plagues are taking away everything that they need to survive. It's also, uh, it's, it's, it's got another meaning in that all of these plagues are attacking some Egyptian god to show the power of Yahweh as greater. Then we get to the ninth plague and it's darkness. For some of you, that might not sound like the worst thing in the world. For someone like me, who is afraid of the dark, that's a terrifying thought. For three days, there's no light. Three days, I can't see, I can't do anything. I can't do anything productive, for sure. They don't have electricity back then. At best, they've got candles. 
And those only last a certain amount of time. Then you get to the final plague. And we know that this is the, the, the start of the Passover. You take the, the blood of a one-year-old unblemished lamb, put it over your doorpost, and the angel of death will pass over you, representative of the Christ. And what we do every Lord's Day in partaking of the Lord's Supper. But what I think, at least I, sometimes do is I pass over the reality of what Egypt went through. Pharaoh would not let the people go. And because of one man, an entire nation, an entire nation suffered. Verse 30 of chapter 12. Pharaoh rose up in the night he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. Think about this for a second. And visualize your home, visualize your neighborhood, visualize your city, your nation. For there was not a house where someone was not dead. Pharaoh's hardness of heart, his lack of faith, in God caused an entire nation to suffer the loss of someone that they loved. Faith. Without it, without it, life is hard. He ends up hardening his heart again as he goes into the Red Sea and is washed away with his army. But, but what about closer to Jesus' time? Surely it's easier to have faith when, when you get to see God, right? When you get to see the Lord. Well, let's think about the Pharisees for a minute, shall we? I found this to be an interesting choice because the Pharisees are, are righteous. As Brother Myron talked about this morning. They were righteous. They, they made sure that they followed exactly what they were to do. And they, they gave of the dill, and they gave of the cumin, and they tithed all the things they were supposed to tithe, and they said the prayers when they were supposed to say the prayers, and they attended the assembly when they were supposed to attend the assembly. They did everything that they were supposed to do. But they also gave up the Son of Man to be crucified. And so while they might have been worshiping God the Father, they did not recognize or have faith in what the scriptures foretold that Jesus the Son would be with them. And so while they were trying to worship the Lord, they were actively opposing God. We see later in the book of Acts that Gamaliel warns the leading Jews against such a thing, to let them do what they're going to do. But the Pharisees in this time, I guess they weren't as smart as Gamaliel was. Or at least he didn't speak up then. In chapter 23, we have all of these woes. These seven woes. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces, for you neither enter yourselves nor allow those who would enter to go in. Well, if they're not entering the kingdom of heaven, what do they lack? Faith. They lack faith. Then we go over to chapter 26, and we see that the Pharisees conspire with Judas in order to deliver Jesus over, and it says they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And then Judas goes and betrays Jesus with what is supposed to be a sign of affection, a worldwide sign of affection, a kiss. Betrays the Son of Man delivers him up to die. And Judas, in, in his grief and his sorrow and his understanding that he did wrong, goes and gives the 30 pieces back. And the Pharisees say, this is blood money. They knew what they did. They understood fully what they did, that it was wrong. So they bought a field to fulfill the scripture. What about Thomas? Another interesting choice, huh? Thomas had faith, didn't he? We call him Doubting Thomas, but he had faith. Well, turn with me over to John, if you, if you would like to. If you don't want to, that's okay. You just keep it in Hebrews. But John chapter 20. 
Because as I was reading through this account, as I was reading more about Thomas, I realized that, that he, he lost his faith. There was a point in time that I believe Thomas lost his faith. Starting in verse 24 of chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, who has spent three years now with Jesus, who has studied under him, who has listened to him, who has seen the miracles. Hey, if anybody's aware, it's going to be one of the apostles, right? Who's called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So there was apparently a time where Jesus came and saw the 11. Thomas was not there. He didn't get to see Jesus. So the other disciples told him, can you imagine that conversation? The 11 going to Thomas? Do you know how giddy they must have been? How excited they must have been? Thomas, Thomas, the Lord is back. He rose. He's here. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. All 11 of them, all 11 confessing that the Lord has risen. And Thomas, Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Never. A man who has seen all these miracles, who has, Jesus has risen people from the dead. And Thomas goes, Whatever y'all are saying, unless I see it with my own eyes, I will never believe. He lost faith. He didn't have it. Now he found it, which is why he is the segue to those who found it. Because Thomas did find his faith. And you read in verse 28, he says, my Lord and my God. Thomas found faith, and so too did Rahab. Rahab in Joshua chapter 2, we read about her. And the more that I think about this, the more I study this, the more, uh, the more I see the connection here. Joshua chapter 2. Starting in verse 1, it says, Joshua the son of Nun sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab, and lodged there. And so Rahab, Rahab is hearing all of the things that are going on and that have happened at the Exodus. She must have heard. I mean, it wasn't too many years prior that it had happened. Joshua had taken over when Moses had passed. They had wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, but the stories must have stayed. The stories must have been there. She must have known what had happened. And unlike Pharaoh, she believed. She understood what God was capable of doing, and she knew that she did not want to be in opposition to him. And so what did she do? Well, she hid the spies. She hid the spies. She took care of them. She might argue the morality of it, but she lied to the guards to hide the spies, to protect her family, to stay on the side of the Lord. And then we see in, in chapter 6 the fruit of what is promised to her. Spies told her that you will be safe. Put this piece of red cloth outside your door, you will be safe. And then in verse 14, excuse me, uh, I might have gotten the wrong verse there. Uh, verse 23, starting verse 22 here. But to the two men who had spied out the land, Joshua said, go into her house and bring out from there the woman and all who belong to her as you swore to her. So the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab and her father and mother and brothers and all who belonged to her, and they brought out all the relatives and put them outside the camp of Israel. Rahab knew what was coming. She knew what was about to happen. The destruction of Jericho. Annihilation of that people. And in fact, we read the very next verse. It says, they burned the city with fire and everything in it. Rahab did not want to be a part of that. And so she believed in all the stories that were told about God. 
She had faith that they were true. She had faith that God could do it again. She even had faith that they would destroy Jericho, where she lived the stronghold of a city. She believed that. She had faith in God. And so she acted accordingly. And what we see is that not only did she act accordingly and receive the promise here, but she is mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, you see that Rahab is a part of the genealogy of Christ because of her willingness to follow her faith in God and to do something about it. She's also mentioned in Hebrews 11, what we call the hall of faith. Well, what about Simon? There's lots of Simon, so that, that could be a little misleading. But Simon the Magician. What about Simon the Magician? You know, when we think of Simon the Magician, we, we typically focus on the part where he wants the power of the Holy Spirit, right? But let's read a little bit earlier. It says, there's a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city. I don't know what kind of magic. I don't know if he was doing card tricks, but he was there. And it says, he amazed the people of Samaria saying that he himself was somebody great. This man believed that he was something special, that he was the colloquial word we used to say, the bee's knees. He thought he was pretty cool. And it says they all paid attention to him. They all paid attention, from the least to the greatest. And they said of him, they said, this man is the power of God. Not has, this man is the power of God that is called great. So all the people believe that he's something special. All the people believed he was something great. It says they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip, as he preached good news about the kingdom of God, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That's a wonderful thing. All these people, that have, have been looking up to Simon as this great, great person. They, they hear about Jesus, and they're baptized. They believed. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip. Simon was a brother in Christ. Simon was a Christian. I think a lot of times we, we see someone get baptized, we celebrate and we're, we're excited for them and we expect them to live perfectly immediately. We expect them to have all the faith that we have after having years and years of experience and growing our faith. Simon still needed some help. He wasn't a full disciple yet. He was a believer. He was a baptized believer. He was saved, but he wasn't a disciple yet. He didn't understand what it truly meant to be a Christian. And so that's where we get in, in verse 18. Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. He offered them money. A little under the table. Give me, can you give me some of that? I want some of that power. I want to be able to do what they do. That, that sounds good. Why? Well, we can speculate. It mentions in verse 21, it says, You have neither heart nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right with God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. Well, what was the intent of his heart? We're not sure entirely, but I strongly believe that he missed being somebody great. And he wanted that power again to amaze people so that all people would listen to Simon. He wanted that power. It, it hadn't fully left him that desire, that temptation to be somebody special, to be somebody important, not to be a servant. Simon answered, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. He still had room to grow. He found faith, but that faith still had to grow. It still had to be nurtured, it had to be taught, it had to be built up and edified. We'll read just a little bit later in the text, starting in verse 26, that Philip is going down from Jerusalem to Gaza, and he sees an Ethiopian eunuch, a man who is uh, high up, in the Ethiopian government. It says he's a court official of Candace, who is the queen. 
And this man was in charge of all her treasure. So he had some clout, didn't he? As opposed to Simon the magician who feigned clout, this man had clout. He had something. And Philip goes over to him. The Spirit says to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And Philip must have been really fast because it said Philip ran to him and heard him reading as it. He caught a chariot. Now, I don't know if that was a lame horse at the front. I don't know if they were just plop plopping along. I don't know what was going on, but Philip must have been fast. And he caught up and he said, do you understand what you're reading? What a wonderful question. Brethren, if you see somebody reading the Bible, why don't you ask them that? Why not? Ask them, do you understand what you're reading? What a wonderful opportunity to talk about God's word. And this eunuch, humble. How, how can I? How can I understand unless someone guides me? And so then he invited Philip to come. He just met this guy as a stranger. Invite him up into his chariot. He was reading from Isaiah 53. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before a cheer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. Christ didn't open his mouth when he was accused of all those things. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation for his life is taken away from the earth? Jesus was killed. So the eunuch says, about, about whom? I ask you, does the prophet say this? Is, is this about himself? Or is this about someone else? He doesn't mention Jesus. He might not even know about Jesus. But he's wondering, is this, about, is this about Isaiah? Or is Isaiah writing about someone? Who is this about? And Philip opened his mouth. That's an important part of that, isn't it? He had to say something. He had to talk. He had to speak about Jesus. He had to share his faith with a man who was asking, with a man who was curious. And he shared his faith, and he said, so beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Beginning with where he was. He went where the eunuch was, and he talked to the eunuch about the Christ. And he must have said something of import. Because in verse 36, we see as they're going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said what? See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Is there anything standing in my way? Is there any obstacle to which I might be saved? He commanded the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And what was the eunuch's response? But in verse 40, excuse me, 39, came up out of the water, and the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. He was happy. He was excited. Of course he was excited. He just had his sins forgiven, all of his wrong deeds just washed away by the blood of Christ. Of course he's excited. He knows in whom he has believed. And he has faith in the Son of God. Let's do a quick little intellectual exercise before we wrap it up. Noah. In verse 7, it says, of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, it says, By faith Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir of righteousness that comes by faith. Think for a moment with me. What would have happened if Noah did not have faith? What would have happened if he did not construct an ark? When we read 1 Peter chapter 3, we see that there were eight people that were saved. It was Noah, his wife, and his family. That's it. So if his family is not saved, who then is? If Noah did not have faith, where is the world today? And really, in my mind, it's entirely plausible that Noah might not have believed. Because God told Noah that there was going to be rain come down from the heavens. You know where rain came from at that time? 
from the ground, from the dew. Rain was not a, rain was not a word that he probably even knew because it wasn't a thing. It was a made-up word to Noah. And God told him, listen, there's going to be rain coming down. <laughs> What's this rain you're talking about? Build an ark, a, a really big boat to house all of the animals? Well, that sounds a little scary and dangerous. I don't know if I want to do that. But he did have faith. And so then we get to Abraham. Well, what about, what about Abraham? It says, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. He went out not knowing where he was going. Well, what if he didn't go? What if he didn't leave? Where would the Israelite nation be? Who would be the father of the Israelite nation? I believe wholeheartedly, as we are going to soon talk about in Esther, that God could have raised somebody else up for deliverance. Just as Jesus and the Father could raise up from the stones around them people to praise the Lord. It's not a question of the possibility of it, but Abraham was the one who was chosen. So what happens if Abraham doesn't have faith? What happens if he doesn't have faith in order to offer his son? If he doesn't believe that God could raise him from the dead as we read about here, verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, his only son, who he had in his late age, who was going to be the, the, the father of, a, of great many nations. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son. Verse 19, it says, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the... He was willing to kill his son because he knew that God would raise him up. But what if he didn't have that faith? Would the promise still have stood? What about Moses? Moses struggled with his faith. 80 years old, arguing with God. Lord, I don't want to do that. No, don't make me do that. I don't want to do that. God says, you're going, and I'm sending Aaron with you. He said, okay. But what if he didn't say, okay? What if he went somewhere, if he went back to Midian? What if he went elsewhere and he didn't follow the Lord? Well, who then raises the Israelites up and gets them out of slavery, out of bondage? Who does that? It was Moses that was chosen, and it was his faith that allowed it to happen. Brethren, faith is absolutely vital. I don't know if you can read that very well. I tried to make it uh, readable. But throughout the book of Hebrews, specifically chapter 11, we see that by faith, these people did something. And so by faith, they conquered kingdoms. They enforced justice. They obtained promises. They stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of fire. They escaped the edge of the sword. They were made strong. They became mighty in war. They put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead. Elijah raising up the son of the widow. That all sounds pretty nice, huh? By faith they received all these. They became mighty in war. They received back their dead. But then by faith, they suffered mocking and flogging. They, 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 they endured chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They were sheep and goat skin. They, they were destitute. They were afflicted. They were mistreated. By faith, they wandered. It's not always easy being a Christian. Here in the States, I, I would venture to say that some aspects of our life are much easier than others. But it hasn't always been that way. In fact, we live in such a uniquely prosperous society that it dwarfs the rest of the world and the rest of history by comparison. And so, I really only have one question for you. If your name was to be in the Hall of Faith, what would it say about you? By faith, 
you did what? Tonight we didn't talk too much about how to increase our faith or really necessarily even how to acquire it. It simply talked about the importance of having it. If you are struggling with either of those, how to acquire it, how to increase it, please come find me. Come let me know. Be happy to have a Bible study with you and talk you through all of these things and, and, and increase my own faith as well. I would love to do that. If there is any need that you have, we ask that you come forward now as we stand and sing.